I am Yamato Cannon, and this is Muffin, and you're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. Right, this is going to be another episode of Talk to Thorin, which is an interview series I have here. And my guest for this one is going to be Solo, who most recently played with TSM. But as we will get into in this interview, he's played with many different teams in the NLCS slash the LCS, as it is now called in the franchising era. Right, Solo, at the start, let's just actually start off there. Like People might have seen you've come on some episodes of some of my talk shows I've done before. And a, a central theme, because it just seems to be, for whatever reason, the theme of your career in the LCS is you've been like, in and out of a bunch of teams and oftentimes it's been that you just seem to get called in like like when the season starts to get fucked and then the roster goes like off kilter <laughs> they just seem to like call you but the one I don't understand is in the modern day it's like they don't not not that many people let you like start the season though it's like you're, you're only allowed to come in and try and clean up the mess of a semi-fucked season or scuffed it would you say have you seen a similar trend what, what what's going on with that yeah I mean um that's definitely pretty accurate for what's my career has been, especially in like the last few years. Um, and I'm sure there's like a lot of reasons for it, but um, it is kind of funny that that's kind of what I've become known for. Um, but for me, I mean, uh, I would definitely like to be like, you know, I like being at the beginning and stuff, but honestly, I just love being involved in esports and League of Legends. So I think I'm just happy to like get opportunity after opportunity. Um, because it's just been a joy for me to be like, be a part of it. Right, obviously, I'll trust that people have an eye test and can look in the game if they think someone has skills or can do outplays and stuff and can play the late game League of Legends. So I, I would just say, if any, I would say from watching for years and years, I've always thought you were pretty good when you get in the game. It seems like actually, I always think what does that basically imply that pattern? Like I'd ask you the same question. Does it like, are there positives from that? Does it actually imply as weird as this sounds like essentially if there's problems in the team and you want to like stabilize things like you're a veteran player or they know what style you can play or the, you've, you might even have hit pack history with some of these coaches. Cause the weird thing is you could take it as a diss. Like what the fuck? Why not I the starter or why don't you contact me first okay. in the off season? If you, if you like me, or I think I'm reliable or whatever. What would you take from that? What do you, what th conclusions do you draw from this pattern? That's played out in your career yeah i mean it's hard because i think there's just so many nuances to like what decisions are made when it comes to gms and roster building um a big thing for me i feel like since i'm kind of like a known quantity in a ways is something that people like to say that i'm not as like attractive for a gm to be like whoa you know this like we have this player who everyone knows what's kind of they're about and if I get them, it just kind of is what it is. But if they get this brand new player who's like young, maybe, and hasn't really had the spotlight yet, um, if they do well, you know, they can either like flip their contract or maybe it just literally looks good for them on paper because the GM's like, oh, I discovered this player and I gave him the opportunity. Um, I think that's a big part of it, too. I, I think um, part of it as well, I mean, I think sometimes roster building GMs just overlook like the simple things and um a, a big part of that is just having players who like understand the game and know how to play the game and can work well with like different type of personalities and we just run to scenarios where roster looks good on paper kind of how we saw with like dignitas this split for example looks good on paper and then when the players actually mesh together it just like it's like no sense um and so the, I, I, it's kind of just a bunch of things but i i don't really think it has much to do with me um I think that like my experience on teams has been pretty positive, um, even from like coming in late or at the beginning of teams. Um, so I I don't know. I think it just comes down to a lot of like want to be a little bit more flashy than normal for GMs. Do you think, by the way, in light of like what you were highlighting there, do you think that is a trend you've seen in the LCS where basically, because I've noticed there's a version of this in the LEC, I could give you an example of in Europe, which is basically, it's not even that you have to have like dropped off as a player. It's that if, as you say, you're a known quantity, like people know roughly how good you are. I'll give you a great example. A few seasons ago when he dropped off in his play, this actually even happened to Nuke Duck, who's like a super veteran of the LEC. But what happened was, because mm -hmm. the perception was like, you know, oh, he's just going to be like, whatever, you know, the fifth best mid laner, but he's not going to be like the MVP. VP. People were actually at that point willing for real to just take solo queue players or ERL players. And their logic was, it's not that they actually def definitely know that they're better than Nuke Dog. Their logic just was like, but maybe they could be though, the potential though. And, like, yeah. and everyone was like drawn in by the novelty of like, but what if this guy is the next, whatever, it caps or some ridiculous example that they never would be, you know. Do you think in the LCS, do people get like as players... 
do people get, and people call it often on these shows, like Reddit narratives, do people get like sort of labeled? And once the label's applied, <laughs> it, do you think other people just take that for granted that that's who this person is? That's the role they're going to play? That's even the style they're going to, does that happen, do you think? Um, definitely. And I think the big difference, I mean, they try to do that with uh, LCS, like bringing in the players who are doing well in, in um, I guess, what is it, the Academy League and some of the amateur leagues. But the big difference for Europe is the ERLs are just the talent levels way higher. Sure. So taking someone who's dominating ERLs and bringing in the LEC is like not nearly as much of a gap and jump that it is bringing them from Academy. Um, and we've seen that like most Academy players who come in... Um, are not making like nearly as much as the leaps as some of the ERL players coming to LEC or some of the up and coming talent. Um, so I don't know. I, I hope that like, I mean, I'm always good for giving people opportunity, but it just seems a little bit more rushed when it comes to how they do it in LCS. And like you're saying, like a lot of players just get kind of put in a box of like, Oh, this is where your skill level is. Like, this is how good you're only able to be. Um, and either they just don't get opportunities based off that or the opportunities they get are just like not very um, positive for them. And then they just end up being kind of like whatever, kind of thrown around um, and don't really have a chance to really break out. Because uh, I think we've seen like my, my, I feel like my scenario, I got on a good team, like we made finals and had a lot of success. I'm, I'm sure there's other players who just bounce up and down. Even Licorice right now is just making finals. Yeah, like true. players can have like pretty big swings in terms of, productivity just based on like what they do where their environment is and i mean people have off years and off splits where they're going to be worse than they are normally um so I, I i just think that you know it's great and everything like known quantities you know i get people want to have like the brand new players and see what they can get which i'm all for but i think just for stability of the league and like the talent level maintaining it's just good to have players who have been around for like a long time just getting opportunities over and over again because there's tons of potential out there for players to be better it's just all about like moving around the pieces and finding out what fits best for a team. How would you define what is Solo's game currently as a top laner? Because another reason I'm always surprised, actually, that so many rookies get tried across all positions in the LCS is if I had to actually pick like a cynical, if I was like the opposition coach doing the scouting report on the whole league of the LCS, I would say the stupid thing is like, if you look in the history, the reason why people like Impact someday, will, maybe even Licorice, will have a career forever if they want, is there's actually a very kind of limited style of top lane that LCS wants to play. And quite frankly, the star players are nearly all was the fucking mid laner in the ADC. That's just the way these teams end up being built. Also allows you to do simplistic league, like front to back team fight, just have five and fives and fight around objectives, which is classic LCS style player. I even feel like top lane's not really the role personally. I would try to like flex like rookies into, especially not this idea of like, they're going to be like a carry thing. It's like not the LPL player. Like <laughs> it's a fucking LCS. He's probably going to play a fucking Zion or Nar or, you know, like it's, it's a pretty yeah. defined sort of position, top lane and LCS, right? Yeah, it does always seem to come back to the, like the same play style, especially if you're trying to compete um, and like go to Worlds for LCS. I, I think the only person I can really remember even doing well um, and having success on like carrying and getting played around was just Broken Blade. Um, I feel sure. like he was like kind of the only player that made it happen and actually had success with it. Uh, but you're right, there is like the similar archetype for most of the successful teams, um, and it kind of and. It's funny too because I don't even think that the players like Impact or Someday or like even myself are are incapable of playing like carry tops. It's just so much easier. Like if you just play LCS or you just watch LCS a lot, like it just makes sense the way that a team like is, is successfully like to win. You just play around bottom a lot. You like stack dragons. Top is like kind of an island. You don't really want to put a bunch of resources because they're gonna really be meaningless later on in the game. So. Yeah, it's not so much like a skill issue. It's just once you've been playing a lot at pro level, it just makes sense. Um, and and I think that's that's a big thing. And it, it's the same like across a lot of leagues. Obviously, LPL and um, likes to play around top like a little bit more. But I, I think for the most part, just like keeping it simple like that is like been the most successful aspect of um, how to win around L in NA. Right, what we'll do is I'll, I'll just ask about a few different teams, but we'll bounce around wherever you feel like. So just to get a sense of what you currently think of where leagues at the moment, how, 
obviously the end of this experience at TSM was ominous or weird or not the way anyone planned for, but how was the actual yeah. time playing on TSM? It was an interesting roster. Obviously the saddest thing for me is just because LCS still has the classic old format, unlike some of the other leagues, people will unfortunately very rarely ever remember like how a team did during a split. They just remember the end. So sadly they'll think <laughs> at the end, if they look on like league PD, like that wasn't that good. But like at one point in time, obviously this team was right in the mix with teams that have since gone to the final and the top placings and stuff. A lot of people wondered maybe TSM would be a t playoff team, obviously. So how has the TSM experience been? Um, I, I think my time on TSM was quite good. I think the roster... I mean, obviously, I think we had some of the best management. I think Glenn and Chowie um, and Christine were, like, all really great. You know, they were really strapped in terms of, like, how many people they had helping them. So I think they put in so much work and that kind of made the difference. Um, as far as like the roster and the team goes, I honestly have never had a team that I felt like, I feel like most of the time you get on a team and you can know pretty quickly, like, are we going to win games? Are we just kind of going to be getting stomped on like every week? And you can like see if a team like actually has potential. And I felt like we were so close to breaking through and being like a legitimately good team that can, you know, win a series and contend. Um, but we were just we just like couldn't get out of our own way or we would just make like minor mistakes and i think for me it was like as much as i really enjoyed the team it was kind of disappointing that we couldn't get to the next level i think that was just for it for me and we saw that in a lot of our games especially like later in the year or later in the split just really silly mistakes when it came to like 20 minute fights that you really have to win to like secure the win um we would either just do something dumb to start a fight and just get completely wiped or if we want to fight we would just make bad decisions so it was just a really hectic team but i do think there was like a lot of talent and a lot of potential on there okay one uh, one thing i wanted to know actually was what was it like to work with the jungler that seemed like an interesting like roster when i saw it announced so how, how did that work in tsm i mean boogie was um uh, well one thing i was surprised his english is a lot better than i thought it was going to be which was nice okay um, Boogie is like such a, I, I respect him so much because he is probably one of the hardest working players I've seen. Um, I think I've never seen someone be like so engrossed in trying to like learn everything about league and watching VODs all the time, like putting in tons of hours watching tape. So I have like tremendous respect for him because he really, really, really wants to win and like learn the game. Um, I think that. He is, like, really smart when it comes to skirmishes and, like, early fights. I mean, the only problem with him is he just doesn't have, like, the most amount of vision when it comes to winning the game, like, past 20 minutes. Right. I think that he just kind of struggled on good engages when it's, like, really 5v5 or just, like, good angles, um, like, maybe some poor decision-making. But I think his early game and just his understanding of, like, skirmishes and, like, 3v3s and 2v2s was really, really strong. And he, and he had, like, some of the most aggressive play styles that I've worked with so far. So uh, I thought he was a really good player, and I thought he did really well. And I mean, it's always really hard for players, like, coming into a team where you don't have, like, someone else that you can really talk to in your language. So I think given that, like, I thought he excelled really well with being able to, like, articulate what he was trying to say. Because not having someone who like speaks Korean and you're the only Korean player is pretty tough. So I got I think he did really well with what was happening. By the way, I realized during the year when Alfari was on Team Liquid, you were like in and out of different teams and stuff. But was he somebody you actually got to play against in like scrims and stuff? Because I heard from some people like at the time that actually a lot of people were very impressed with individually how he played on that team. Um, with Alfari? Yeah. Um, I don't really think I had that much time to play against Alfari. Um, this is 2021, right? Yeah, something like that. But with, uh, yeah, I mean, Alfari was great from what my experience was against him. I mean, he is just such a smart player. I feel like Summit in a lot of ways is similar. Okay. Um, just like the way he plays. They're just really smart, punishing players. I don't know. It's weird sometimes. Like, some players just have such good laning and... It's hard to really like explain what that means. They just seem like they get a little bit out of everything. Like every little CS that you go for, maybe they get like a little bit of a good trade or they just get like a small advantage. And then if, you know, they never miss any CS, um they just 
whittle you down. And it's kind of impressive, like how focused and tuned in they are to the landing phase. And I think that's, I think it's like Summit is probably one of the best at that uh, and punishing you for like making mistakes. And I think like Fudge is also like pretty great at that aspect. Um, he's a little bit more like passive, uh, not as crazy, but he just kind of gets exactly what he wants like every landing phase. I mean, he just kind of is locked in, it seems like. When you referenced earlier the team that you were in when you had the finals runs, which is obviously the FlyQuest lineup a couple of years ago when we had to play online a bit, right? In this time period, I always thought that lineup's actually mad underrated because it's almost like if you look at the names, obviously there's name value. A lot of these players have been in top teams, won championships or been in finals. But that's actually like you almost, it's like whoever put that lineup together almost caught every player while they were still like pretty good though. Like they actually were pro- like, and all of them now would be like the bench player or lower level team. Mm-hmm. But this was actually when everyone was like right on the cost play. I feel like whoever that just seemed like a very shrewdly put together team. Was it a, what was it a team that actually behind the scenes functioned well? It seemed like it was pretty well balanced as a squad. Yeah, I think that FlyQuest team, I mean it's the best team I've ever been on. Um and I think you're right, like it just kind of just came together at the perfect time. I think that not only were we all like stylistically really cohesive, um, but everybody was like playing really well and kind of had some people like peaking really hard. So it just, I mean, it, it just made so much sense. I think we were like one of those teams where we're kind of like above the, I forget what the what saying is, but you know, we're more than the sum of our parts uh, sort of thing. So I, I, I mean, we definitely should have won, <laughs> should have won in summer, but um, yes. TSM like had a really good prep um, and they came into, they were really hungry coming in. So but I, I think that team was great, and I think it just shows that you don't necessarily have to have like the most insane like players as long as you just have a team that makes sense, like play style together. Everybody's open to you know any type of feedback, and they're willing to you know adjust to be best for the team. Um, so yeah, I thought that was like a very good archetype for like what you want to do to build like a championship caliber team. Is is it's like right there on paper, you know? You just got to do something similar to that. Like you say, for the summer split run, right? Normally, if an underdog makes the final, it should be more like it was in the spring one, where it's like, well, obviously the favorite wins. And then if you're the underdog, it's like, well, you know, making the finals good. Like, if people didn't <laughs> see this final, like, this was such a really back and forth series and absolutely FlyQuest could have won. And at the times it looked like you were going to, right? Yeah, for the TSM one. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's so funny. I think that. I mean, obviously, we went to Worlds with TSM later, and we scrimmed them a lot um, in that playoff bracket. And, I mean, no, like, shade towards them. I think that they just showed up and were the better team that day. But it was, like, kind of very fortunate. I think we just really came in and were not playing at our best selves. I, I, I think that um, we were certainly the better team that year, or that, like, whole split, but definitely not the better team that day. Um so they, I, I think a lot of it came down to they were just really hungry to win and they were kind of rolling after going through like the losers brackets, and like pre pre draft prep is like a really big deal. And I thought that their game plan for like the whole entire match was just really really smart, and our game plan was kind of messy, um, and we definitely could have optimized it a little bit more. So you know, props to them because they they got it done that day. But um, I certainly think that yeah, it was kind of. And they, I mean, they just clutched it, man. That's like, it really is that. I got yeah, props true. to them. Like, they clutched it really hard. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. That's just what sports are. So, but uh, yeah, I'm really proud of that, like, FlyQuest team. I think that it, it just made sense. It felt super good to be that cohesive. Like I say, obviously it contrasts completely with the spring final where you played the Cloud9 team that just was unbeatable. Like no, no one could beat yeah. them. I thought, isn't that the one as well where there was like that story where like even in scrims, didn't they just win the majority of the time and they were like fucking around experimenting and stuff like that was just one of those cases where like no one could beat that team, right? Oh yeah, that, the yeah the spring split Cloud9 was pretty insane. I, I don't know if I've seen a team that have more like of a gap between the competition um, as that one. So it's a shame they didn't get to go to the MSI. Yep. Because it would have been good to see them versus some of the international teams. But yeah, that Cloud9 team was just insane. I don't know what it was. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it was just Blabber is so good. And then you match him with um, a player like Niski, who's just like all about empowering their jungler. And then Blabber just runs over the map and he just beats everyone up. So 
Um, uh, yeah, that team was insane. And I think that they were also really good in summer, but what was kind of funny is everybody just stopped scrimming them, um, like all the other top teams. Like, we stopped scrimming them. Uh, because One, because we just weren't playing well versus them, so we were like, what's the point of this practice? But I think also it's like, all right, well, we're like obviously kind of mental blocked versus them or something because they just beat our ass every time. And we're going to play them in playoffs eventually. Let's just not play them um, now. And then hopefully when we get into our match, like it's just like a whole new kind of environment. Maybe we can surprise them or something. So I think that was like probably the biggest difference maker. And I think a lot of teams took that on too, where we just didn't scrim Cloud9 because it's just don't give them any more um, kind of confidence. What was it actually like to go to Worlds that year? Because you've had a pretty, if people don't know, you've had a pretty long career. I mean, you were even playing like competitively before you got to the LCS for a few years, way back in the day. Like you're not actually maybe as young a player as people imagine. So if you watch the LCS, like historically, it's not a region that sends a lot of surprise teams to Worlds. Like usually it's just the obvious people. It's if you're on Cloud9 or TSM, depending on what year, Team Liquid, we all know the teams that all go. So was it satisfying? Like, like sort of like out of nowhere in the middle of your career to get this cool chance to actually go to Worlds? be one of the representatives yeah i mean going to worlds is awesome i think the best thing about worlds is just how much you get to like how much better you get to understand the game when you're playing against like top tier competition um i just remember like when we scrim like lpl teams or the top lck teams they're just playing like a whole new level i don't know it's kind of hard to really explain they just don't make mistakes and the fundamentals are just so locked in that if you like in in na like the, the thing we joked about was the thing we joked about was like okay if if dragon's coming up you just uh you can just show up to dragon whenever they'll just wait for you you know and one team has has control of river and they just walk into dragon and, and you're just like okay guys like you know they'll just wait there and they'll be like okay we'll wait for them to come in and then we'll five v five them for the dragon but when you do that against like the top teams, either one they just take it instantly, and there's no there's no dragon to go fight, <laughs> right. or or they just kill you when you walk in. They're just like, oh, they're walking in. Let's just fight them, and then you get jumped on, and you instantly lose it. So, just like the pace they play at, and how much they punish you for being like lazy or late to objectives is pretty insane. And for me, like individually, I just thought that the laning phase of a lot of the players were just pretty, like pretty spectacular. I think that. It kind of showed me like a new way to play where like before I was just, I, I think the way I thought about it was before like it, it, you just play like for fun almost. I mean, it's kind of like weird to say, but when you're in laning phase, I feel like the way people play in NA, it was just, oh, I have my abilities up. Like, let's, let's just trade into them. Like, let's just fight for fun. Like, <laughs> if my abilities are up, let's just fight. Um, and then you play against like better competition, and if you play like that, you just instantly get punished by like their jungler, um, or your wave gets in like a bad spot. And then the other guy's like only fighting you when his jungler's coming, or it's like super advantageous. Um, and they just don't do it for fun; they're just being smart, like because they know that to win the game, it's all about just pressure. It's like getting prio, um, getting vision, and they know that like just doing these small trades just to do something is not really worth it um, as far as keeping the game stable. Especially when top is supposed to be like you know, the most stable part of the map. Um, and, I, and I think that's kind of like the big thing I took away from it is just making sure that my laning phase isn't like volatile just for the sake of being volatile just because I feel like it. So... Right, obviously the big result at this Worlds was actually against top esports, one of the best teams in the world, the LPL team, who are the champions, obviously. Right, when you played against this team, like, not, if people don't know, like, this roster, even all the players pretty much, except for the support guys, still fighting now, they're on all the top LPL teams, they're like, they're some of the best LPL players ever. Was What was this yeah. result like? Like, was it just out of nowhere? Did you actually think this was a team you had a chance against? Um... Yeah, I, I mean, I thought we played pretty well against all the teams um, in our group. Um, and top, I, I, mem I mean, the game that we won, I mean, the big thing I remember was, I think bot lane was smurfing really hard. Um, but the but, but they also had, like, a pretty terrible draft. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that, yeah, I remember the draft was terrible, um, which obviously made it a lot easier. And then as far as, uh, like, playing DRX, I think it was DRX at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they just were just a better version of our team in a lot of ways. <laughs> it was like as simple as that. We played like really similar. 
styles. Um, we just both played like very slow, like objective oriented teams, and they were just better at it. I mean, that's just kind of what it was. They were like individually better at it, and as a team, just more cohesive at it. So, um, both those games were really close, but I mean, they're just they're just better team for sure. As I said, you, you've played perhaps longer than people realise because of the many times you've been in and out of the league and it's almost like you appear again as a recurring character and then you're out for a year or six months or whatever. Do you think of yourself as a veteran? Like like one thing I've always thought is interesting about esports is if a casual fan doesn't know this, maybe in the modern day players do this, but I doubt it was even the case until recently. But most people I know, you don't really plan to be pro. What happens is you play the game. It's why I always tell people, don't ever quit school, kids. It's like if you aren't basically that far below pro before you quit school and go like you just weren't good enough mate. like all these guys they played like semi-pro basically or they were amateurs and they just got really good at the game or high on the ladder or they got onto a team and they were like hey actually i'm good and so most people it's more like you just are good at the game that you enjoy playing then you just sort of back your way into being a pro somehow and then maybe then you think of things like right like i can get more money in this team or do i want to be a top pro maybe people have goals then but i get the vibe a lot of people don't really think of it as like a career it's not like i'm gonna do this for 30 years like an old-fashioned job so when you've been on as long as you have, I wonder, like, how do you conceive it? Like, are you someone who thinks of, like, in five years, I could still be an LCS player? Am I going to be a pro in that way? Are you towards the end of your career? How do you envision it? Yeah, I. it's strange. I've always talked about how I was going to keep playing until people stopped, like, paying me to play. <laughs> and then I'd try other avenues. Um, I, I don't know. It's such a, like, I mean, competing is just such a fun experience. And... Just is it being still a thrill pro is, to, to play LCS time. matches? Yeah, it's still super hype. Like, I mean, it's a tough job because, I mean, obviously you got a lot of stuff going on um, during the season, but I think it's just the reward from it is so fun. Like, being able to win matches and especially like close matches. Yeah, like, there's nothing like it. It's just, it's just really awesome. And I would like to keep playing and, you know, I want to like win. So, I mean, I, I, I still want to don't just want to be like hanging around just to compete on like me middling teams and doing whatever like i still really wanted to win and i want to do well and improve um but as far as like getting out of it i don't know i don't know when i'm gonna stop playing necessarily um but i still want to be involved like i think for me just getting into coaching league is definitely the afterthought for uh, my career and then just, I don't know how long League will be like a thing, but I mean, I think that just being in esports in general is like what I'm looking for. And I don't mind like trying to move over games and trying to be like more of a coach for another game, kind of like how Zix has done it, uh, moving over to Valorant. So I think I think that there's just a lot of value in kind of like being an esports pro for a long time. I mean, it's you really understand like what other players are going through and kind of like the environments they have to deal with. So I think being able to move games is something that will more than likely happen down the line. Right. What about this? I noticed, like I said earlier, with that question I set up about like the way that typically people play at top lane in LCS, and especially, actually, your point was a good one. It's not even about how the player plays. It's more, actually, how does the coach envision it? How do the teammates envision the game? Like, spoiler, if they all want a tank or a bruiser player, it doesn't really matter how good you are on carries. Like, you can end up playing a tank or a bruiser, right? It means sometimes there are players where I'm sure they, if they had their choice of what they'd pick, they wouldn't always play the things that are meta. Like, obviously, there are classic picks that always find their way into the meta in the LCS. Yes. If you had to pick a champion that defines the best when you're on the top of your game, what what champion in top lane do you want to be playing? <laughs> I mean, I feel like I mean it's probably Orin. Uh, that's definitely probably one of the ones I feel feel best on. Just pretty pretty solid. <laughs> Usually, most of the NA players get flamed on that champion, right? They're considered like they're not that good on it. Um. It, it is strange that more people aren't better at Orn, because it's not necessarily that hard. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. That, I mean, that champ's really useful, for sure. Um, it definitely feels good to play that champ. Um, but, yeah, not, not that many people. It, it's honestly so funny that that players... I mean, we talk about so much about um, like the top teams having tank tank players or players that are definitely more like island players. But it's funny that I feel like a lot of carry players are actually just so bad on tanks, which doesn't really make sense. Yes. Um, 
Especially being a big man, people look down on the tank players and act like it means they're like crap at the game or something. Like to me, I've always <laughs> thought, mate, it was more like jungle. There's players who were just like brain junglers and they aren't like the fucking super sick gang. But it doesn't mean that the guy who's the least sink one trick could just do all that. Like maybe he's just already good mechanically, you know? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think people really underestimate. Like everyone talks about like hands and and mechanics and stuff, but. The more you play the game, the less like you even think about trying to outplay people. It's just it's just all about putting yourself in positions where you have to do the least amount of work. Um, and you see that with like smart players like, who have been doing it for a long time is just the way they manipulate either the wave or their timings. It's just like oh, they just get advantages for free. They don't even need to like outplay them, or they don't even need to interact with the other person. Um, so <laughs> that's that's definitely one of the things that. Um, helps when you played a lot of games and played a lot of time is you, you i don't even i don't remember the last time i outplayed somebody in some crazy like solo kill thing it just never really comes to mind <laughs> just like wow it's more like wow i really outplayed them and their wave is so bad um <laughs> we got free herald and their wave is crap like whoa that's the big outplay i'm looking for at the end of this interview do you have a final message is there someone you want to thank maybe i'll say hello to um Honestly, I think that it's kind of like you're saying, I've been doing this a long time. It's so funny to see how the fans react to me um, nowadays. Because for such a long time, like, I had a lot of like negative baggage and I felt like it was so. It's just so funny how much it's flipped. Like, I think people were kind of like whatever on me for such a long time. And then I, I definitely think the whole mercenary thing brought people a little bit around. And now and now people at least like I, I kinda am where I wanna be in terms of the you know, mind of fans, which is I'm just like a dude that's solid. <laughs> like I'm just doing my thing and you know, playing my best and, and just like a contributor to winning. Um I think that's kind of like what I've always just wanted to be perceived as as someone who's just all about winning winning LCS and doing his job. And so I'm glad that it's like turned that way and there's just like way less extra stuff that um, people are talking about. The Beatles said they get by with a little help from their friends, but I get by with a little help from my Patreon community. And this video was kindly supported by Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Ahmed Haju, Bot Pounder 420, Toucan Animosity, Tobias Bernasconi, Jensen Gore, Tosh, and a special thanks always goes out to my main man, Jerky's Minion. Would you like to ask me a question in my monthly video AMA? Do you want teasers to find out who are the upcoming guests? Maybe you want to take part in one of those lengthy but intense esports discussions I have with my donators or maybe you want to suggest a guest or a topic that I could cover well if any of those tickle your fancy put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today where in the description box below there is a Patreon link